Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for joining. So as you always said, this is a, not a meteorology talk, but it has a lot of really cool pictures and has some useful tools that you could be uh, incorporating in your tool set if you're looking for some new ways to apply the data. And these tools are applicable to very much real problems. And I will do some necessary cuts up and because I guess not everyone has a background in nonlinear dynamics. And this will also be a formal science talk in the sense that I will present some actual new papers as it is mandatory for a talk to be scientific, so to speak. But let's start with a motivating question. So what's a steady state? So that's a term I've heard many times, but uh, I don't think it's so easy to, to pinpoint. So I have some really nice uh, time series on the right side of the screen, and I will now start uh, animating how they evolve in time. And now the question is for you and everyone online, which of these time series would you say so a steady state? Uh, it's not trivial to answer, um, but I really want to have a basic idea of what people think. So if you think four or less of these time series are a steady state, raise your hand now. All right. <laughs> if you think six or more are, are steady state, six or more, like big, big, big money. Do you think are six or more? Then you can raise your hand now. Six or more. Okay, we have at least one six or more. Well, the point of this uh, mental gymnastics is to say that this is not really an easy thing to say because there is always some uh, ambiguity about what a steady state is. And the question is, how can you be precise about it? And one way would be to go down the statistics route and the stationarity. The other way, which is what I will present, is the dynamical systems way, where you say, okay, my the physical system I care about can be approximated using this dynamical system theory that says, okay, I have a nice um, state that is called X, and this state are just the quantities or the variables that describe the system, like temperature or humidity, for example, and they evolve in time given to some arbitrary rules. One example is something you're most likely familiar with, something called the Lorentz model, that describes how it works in a box, but without actually taking <laughs> spatial dimensions of the box into account. So this is an ordinary differential equation system, not a partial differential equation system. But it's a dynamical, dynamical system nevertheless. And with this theory, it is actually really easy to quantify a steady state. And a steady state is an attractor. An attractor is simply a set in the state space that attracts a neighborhood of points. And this neighborhood is finite and greater than zero is called the basin of attraction. Now, something to clarify is that I will be using the word space or state space many, many, many times in my talk. Please don't confuse this with real space. So don't think of longitude and latitude whenever I say space. Instead, think of the possible values for your variables, like the combinations of, uh, I don't know, temperature and humidity. That's what I mean by state space, all right? And any set that attracts other points in the state space towards the set as time evolves is an attractor. It is really a very simple thing. And attractors are useful because they are invariant, and this is a property that is much stronger than stationarity in the terms of statistics. And it means that if you take the attractor and you simply evolve it forwards in time, you get exactly the same set. So for me, this is a really nice quantity for something to have if I want to call this something a steady state. It really captures the word steady. And let me give you some examples so that we can make this abstract notion concrete. So what I have over here is the state space of the Lorentz system that I just presented. And I have some initial conditions that you can barely see, sorry, but it's okay. And they are randomly scattered in the state space. And what I will do now is evolve these forwards in time, all right? I will play this one more time because it looks cool. And as time progresses, all of these initial conditions tend to go to two specific points, single points in the state space, these two points as you see over there. And these are attractors. They have attracted some amount of initial conditions, and they are called fixed point attractors because they are just a single point. But that's, that's not all you can have. You can have something else. So now I do exactly the same exercise, but I change one of the parameters of the Lorentz system, this raw parameter. And you see now that all initial conditions again converge to one object, but this object is not a single point, but is a closed loop. And this is simply a periodic trajectory, uh, which is called the limit cycle as well. And I will do this now once again for a third time, same, same exact exercise. 
uh, for the things in front and let it run. And now you would think, oh, this thing hasn't converged to anywhere yet. Uh, that's not true, actually. What happened is this thing has converged to an attractor, but this is now a chaotic attractor. It is not the same as the previous two that it has, let's say, I don't know, maybe simple uh, properties, but it is very much as valid to consider as an attractor as the other two. And in fact, if you keep anything from this presentation, I hope it's this sentence that all of these three are equally valid for a steady state, at least according to the dynamical systems theory, of course, right? Okay, so we have something that we can quantify as attractors. Now, in the real world, you care about multistable uh, systems. Multistable are just systems that have two or more attractors for the same uh, combination of parameters. Not that I change parameter and I get another attractor. For the same parameters, there are, there are multiple attractors. And if you've had a course in climate dynamics, uh, maybe you have already heard about this because the Earth's climate is a typical example of a multistable system, at least conceptually, because you have the possibility of a snowball earth or of the current state depending on the temperature you started from. Uh, however, I think something much simpler to illustrate this concept is one of my favorite examples, the magnetic pendulum, which is a simple physical system we could have in front of us, but I don't have it, but thankfully I have a computer so I can just draw it. So the way it works is really, really simple. You have a nice pendulum that is hovering above a plane, and at the end there is a charged ball at the pendulum. And on the plane there are three magnets, and it is guaranteed from the dynamics of the system that the pendulum will stabilize itself above one of the three magnets, okay? And what I want to do is find out where this will happen, uh, or oh, sorry, to which magnet it will go. So what I do is I say, okay, I can configure, or sorry, I can record the starting X and Y configuration of this uh, magnetic pendulum. And then I will evolve this magnetic pendulum in time. And if it converges to the, for example, the purple magnet, I will just color this point purple. That's really all there is to it. And now I just repeat this exercise for every possible starting configuration of X and Y, and I get this very beautiful picture. So what this picture shows is the basins of attraction of these three attractors. The, it has three attractors because it can possibly stabilize itself above each of the magnets. So that, that looks great and all. But here we have the challenge of what is practically relevant to do. And of course, it's nice if you can compute this entire thing. That would be nice. But this is actually really expensive. So at least you would like to be able to at least find the attractors, generally speaking, or find their fr the fractions of their basins of attraction. So probabilistically, if I had a random initial condition somewhere randomly in the state space, what is the probability that it would go to one of the three attractors? where it is simply the fraction of the basins of attraction in the state space, probabilistically. And now, unfortunately, for some systems like what I showed before, that is very, very easy to do. But in, in reality, multistability is often quite complex, even for simple systems. Now, here I have simple in quotes because I have a three-dimensional system, which means it has three, uh, three variables. So similar to the Lorentz system I presented initially, but much more complex. So what I will now show is an animation of, again, some random initial conditions that are evolving in time. And I have colored them according to which attractor they will go into. We don't yet know the attractors of the system. And on the right hand side, I have the basins of attraction, which are now three dimensional. So I have an X, Y slice. And as I progress through this animation, the Z coordinate that you see at the top will also progress. So this is how it will, this will look like. And there are two things to point out. First, the basins of the right on the right are super complex. It's not really possible to get any analytical handling of this, of this um, quantity on the right. So you really cannot say analytically, oh, I expect blue to be half of it or something like that. The second thing is how complicated the situation is here because you have three attractors coexisting and one of them is a fixed point that you can barely see. I'm very sorry, it's over here. It's, it's a cyan point that's barely visible because it's small. And the second is a periodic attractor that has white color. And surrounding this periodic attractor is a chaotic attractor with purple color. So you really have a mess of a situation going on. And the point is, OK, you can only tackle this numerically, how to do so. And that's kind of the, let's say, the main purpose of this presentation after this relatively short introduction. All right, so how do you do this? How do you find the attractors and their basins 
generally speaking, without really knowing much about the system. Well, there is one approach where you would just take a lot of initial, uh, initial conditions in the state space, and then you will evolve them forwards in time, and you will take their trajectories. And you will map each trajectory to features that characterize the trajectory. For example, you might get the mean or the standard deviation of some of the coordinates. And then you can cluster these features using a clustering algorithm and say, ah, the clusters are the, the attractors. Here's how this looks like. I have the system I just presented, and I devise four different ways to get features from trajectories, each of the four panels in such a way. So I have here one way that is, ah, get the minimum of the x-coordinate and the standard deviation of the x-coordinate as your features and three more cases. And then I plug these cases to a clustering algorithm and I color the points according to their cluster. And you can see that sometimes it actually works really, really well. I get, I get exactly three clusters corresponding to the three attractors. Unfortunately, some other times it doesn't work because you see here the clustering algorithm think that, thinks that these two things are one cluster and this is the second cluster. And here it fails completely. Red means failed and I don't even know why. So the point is that, okay, this seems like a valid method, but it has a lot of practical drawbacks. First of all, I don't know how long I should be evolving the, systems, the system for, which is where the, the major performance loss comes from, or I do not know a priori which of these magical features would be able to distinguish attractors um, between each other. And there are some other problems that we don't have to discuss right now. So now this is where uh, my work comes in. So what we have proposed as a solution is to not think in terms of features, but really to use the only property an attractor has that is unique to this attractor. And that is very simply its location in the state space. By the very definition, attractors cannot overlap. And the second ingredient to the solution is to use something called the Poincaré recurrence theorem that says something very simple. It says that if I am on, the, on an attractor, and I evolve forwards in time, I am guaranteed to come arbitrarily close to the point I started from. And this is true for any kind of attractor. It doesn't matter if it is chaotic or periodic or whatever. So this is really some very basic ingredients we have. And now how to use them in practice to actually find attractors. Well, we take a dynamical system state space, like the one on the right, and we uh, partition it into a, f a fixed size grid. So this is what these lines show, a fixed size partitioning of the state space. And then we follow along a trajectory that we, that we integrate. So let's say we start here and we follow along the trajectory. Initially, every cell in the state space is, is blank, right? And then we mark visited cells with a special color. Now, as we evolve, at some point we convert to an attractor. And therefore, it is guaranteed that after this point that we have converged, in the near future, we will come back again to a point we have already visited. That's exactly what this nice uh, purple point over here. So, oh, you cannot see my mouse, huh? Ah, oh, damn it. Well, took me only 13 minutes to realize this. <laughs> All right, now you see. Well, so you see now, after some time, we have returned to these points. So now the teal points with the initial mark are starting to be colored as purple points, uh, uh, cells, <laughs> sorry. And now we start counting. How many purple cells do I want to encounter in a row to say that I have enough recurrences to be confident that I am on an attractor? That's something the user decides, not me. So let's say it's three for this example. So after we have enough recurrences, we say, okay, we are confident we are on an attractor. Let's start coloring all subsequent cells as attractor cells. So that's exactly what happens here. As, as I progress, I color every cell yellow, which means it has the yellow attractor. Keep in mind the words yellow and purple and whatever are, of course, uh, human words. In, in practice, these are just integers. And, but that's how it works. That's really the juice of the, of the algorithm. So after we have enough yellow cells, we, we stop the process and we have identified an attractor. And of course, as a side benefit, we know that where we started from must be the, uh, in the basin of attraction of the found attractor. So that really is the process that I just described. Unfortunately, in reality, it has to be much, much harder than I, what I just said. And the reason for that is that you have multiple attractors. That's where, where you care to use this business. Each attractor has their own basins and some orbits might diverge to, to infinity. And you, you would like to use the existing grid information to make convergence faster, 
what do I mean by that? So let's say that we're in this scenario right now, where we have found all of these cells to be basins of attractor A, and these red cells to be basins of attractor B. Now, if I am on a trajectory that is for, me, for a long of time in a row hitting green cells that are in a given basin of attraction, then I can safely assume that I'm already going to converge to the same attractor. It is not guaranteed mathematically, but it is a fair assumption to make. So I would like to be able to do this assumption so I can stop the integration and just assign my initial condition to be in the same basin. So the way to do this is to create a finite state machine this is simply a structure in your computer code that has a state and an internal counter. And it follows along the trajectory, and the state of the finite state machine is just the color of the cell I visit. As long as I visit cells with the same color, the internal counter of the machine increases. And if it reaches a certain threshold, the machine tells to the, to the program, hey, you can stop integrating now, we are confident that we have converged, you don't have to integrate more, label correctly the initial condition and go to a new initial condition. That's what the finite state machine does. And of course, if I change color while I evolve in the, in the state space, then the counter of the finite state machine resets. But that's the business. I won't go into more detail about this because yeah, it becomes a bit too detailed, but the gist of the story is this. All right. Now, how could you use this business if you indeed had a conceptual model that had actual, actual equations and you could, uh, you know, use it in dynamical systems theory? Well, we have made a generic interface to use this, uh, these methods and it is a modular. So the way it works is you first decide what kind of dynamical system you want to have or you already have. And it could be really very arbitrary choice from the discrete systems all the way to Poincaré maps. And then you decide what kind of method you want to use to actually find the tractors. And you could use three methods, and I presented two already. The one is the method with recurrences I just show, and the other was where you featureize trajectories and then you try to cluster them. Uh, oops, sorry. And then the last thing would be to just use this, the existing library functions that just do this thing, right? Just compute the basis of attraction for you. So remember, when in the beginning of the presentation, I showed this very nice picture. So if you wanted to produce this picture yourself, what would you do? Well, that's how it works in actual code, in real practice, nothing, uh, you know, hidden. And it's really simple. You first, this is Julia code, by the way. And you first use, or you first declare the packages that you want to use. And the first is the dynamical system library that we have created, a general purpose software for nonlinear dynamics. And then the next block of code just tells to the computer, oh, this is the dynamical system I want to use, that's it. The second block of code says, ah, this is the kind of uh, structure I want to use to find attractors. And as I said, you have three choices here. And then the last option would be to simply, um, yeah, um, literally call the function basins of attraction that computes the basins of attraction. And I hope no one is surprised by this, right? And then you could use the output of the basins of attraction to calculate the fractal dimension of the basins, which actually now connects to my second part of the presentation. Now that I showed you where to find tractors, why are they fantastic? Well, they are not really fantastic, they are fractal. So fractal is an exotic sounding word that honestly describes something that I think is really, really simple. And so chaotic attractors are typical fract typically fractal. What does this word mean? Well, Fractal is a word that really describes how an, uh, an object behaves under uh, zoom or scaling. And to understand the concept I have on the screen, the circle, this white line is a circle, and with green color I have the, the Koch snowflake, which is a fractal. And what you see is that as I zoom into the, 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 the plot, so here is successive zooms into the plot, the circle loses its original shape information under zoom. So there is no way to tell that this line was originally a circle or whether it was, I don't know, a, a cow, I don't know. But the Koch snowflake has on the other side what you can call absolute zoom invariance, which means the entire offset seems completely the same after zooming. Now, truth be told, this Koch snowflake is a completely contrived example, and uh, it is not practically useful. It is only useful for educational purposes. So how it works in, in reality is what I saw in the last row, which is 
a chaotic attractor, a different one from the ones I've shown before. This one is called from the Henon map. It doesn't really matter. But what these fractal objects have is size scaling zoom invariance. And do not worry, I will define in detail what this means in a moment. But uh, before that, it's good to take a moment and appreciate that uh, this is not just some cool image. It's definitely and primarily a cool image, but fractals are really everywhere. And in fact, the geometrical structures in nature are much more closer or much better described by fractal geometry than they are from or by, uh, let's say, Euclidean geometry. So just this Saturday, I was having a beers with Git, and Git showed me this lovely picture that is from the Antarctic, uh, sorry, Arctic sea ice. And this picture is around 10 kilometers in, in, uh, in width. And on the right-hand side, I had the very first Google result I got by typing frozen pond cracks. And here is something, a point where you can start to understand a bit what this size uh, scaling invariance means. It means that the structures that you see in these pictures have approximately the same relative size as you go down different scales. That's what it means. So really, fractals are, are ubiquitous in, in nature. And one way to characterize them and the fractal properties or the fractality of something is using the fractal dimension. And this is a real number. It is a non-integer number. And we don't really have to go into details what this number means geometrically, because remember, here we are interested about fractal sets, not in the real world, where geometry actually makes a bit more sense, but in the state space. And especially in this scenario, where the fractal object is actually something describing a dynamical system, there the fractal dimension is very, very useful to, to compute or to know its value, its numeric value. And there are two reasons for this. The first reason is that it can guide conceptual modeling, because let's say that you have a time series that you measure from something real, hopefully, and from this time series you can create the, the chaotic attractor, and you calculate the fractal dimension. It's, let's say, 3.5. Now, the ceiling of this dimension, which is the next integer, tells you the minimum amount possible for variables you can use to model the system. So if you have a fractal dimension 3.5, you know it is impossible to model the system with three or less variables. You need at least four. That's one reason why it's important or useful. The second is that it has this really amazing property, if you think about it, that the fractal dimension is a dynamic invariant. Uh, what does this mean? It means that if you transform the original object via a series of diffeomorphisms and you calculate the fractal dimension of the end result, you get the same thing as the first result. So to put this in perspective, think about paleoclimate time series, right? They are not even recording an actual state variable of the system, like temperature. They are recording a proxy of temperature. So you already have a transformation from temperature to the proxy. Then you have a second transformation from the proxy to the output time series, which is the measurement process. So you have a clear manipulation of the original data to the output data. Now, if you think of all of your statistical quantifiers, like the mean or the standard deviation, obviously the mean of the final time series output doesn't tell you anything about the original mean unless you make some assumptions about the transforming properties. On the other hand, because this number, this fractal dimension is invariant, if these transformations have sufficiently good properties, diffeomorphic properties, which means, let's say in practice, most of the time it means that they are invertible. If this is the case, and you compute the fractal dimension for the, the final result, it will be mathematically guaranteed the same as the original result, which is really amazing and uh, you don't really hear often. Not many things have this property that survive transformations. Okay. Cool, great, nice, you convinced us. It's a very cool thing to, to compute. How do you actually do this? Well, here is how, and this is the point where you actually understand what this size scaling uh, invariance means. It means the number of points around the point in the chaotic set, or in the fractal set, scales with the fractal dimension of the set. So let me bring up the pictures and the formula so that this is as clear as humanly possible. Again, the number of points around the point scales with the fractal dimension of the set as you increase the, the, the neighborhood you consider. So here I have a nice point in the middle, red, and I have created a radius, a ball around it, that had radius epsilon. If I compute the average number of points around this red point, which are these 
tail points, and I average this over the, the entire tractor. This is what this formula over here can, does, which is, this is called the correlation sum, and it computes what I just said, the average number of points around the point within radius epsilon. This correlation sum scales with the fractal dimension. As we see, it is literally the size of this ball to the power of the fractal dimension. And that's really it. And in fact, this is not the fractal property. This is true even for the sphere or the cube. It's just that this delta for the sphere or the cube is just three, which is its topological uh, dimension. So to do this in practice, you take a data set, you define some epsilon radii, and then you just compute the correlation sum, and then you plot a log log. And there is, you fit a very, a very nice line in the, in the plot, and the slope of this line is the fractal dimension. So really, that's literally it. You just do a linear regression in the log log plot. No, you don't. Not in the real world. Unfortunately, not in the real world. The reason you can do this in the real world is because, as you all know, the real world is very nasty. <laughs> it has some nasty properties. Uh, the most nastiest of properties of the real world is that it is finite. Unfortunately, every data set coming from the real world is rather small. And the second nastiness is that every data set coming from the real world is contaminated with, with some amount of, of noise. And the worst part is that it may not even record the stationary process. Unfortunately, nothing in my presentation is valid for non-stationary processes, so you can might as well forget everything I said. So let's assume the final point does not happen and we only have the first two problems to, to worry about. And for these first two problems, they make calculating a fractal dimension a bit ambiguous because what you have to do in practice is still do the same computation as before, but now you have to identify a region in this uh, plot of the correlation sum versus the, the radius. So you have to identify a so-called linear scaling region. This means there is a region in this plot where uh, you can see that the slope in every part of this plot is really constant. And that's important. If you cannot find such a linear scaling region that spans a, let's say, a sufficiently large amount of, of sizes, then you cannot really make a valid estimation of the fractal dimension. That's kind of the, the sad part. Actually, it gets even sadder because one estimator, the, the correlation sum estimator, is good versus having small amount of data. So it performs well even if you have small data. Another estimator is good when you have noise in your data, and unfortunately, it's a sad life because you don't have an estimator that is good in both, and you have to somehow, yeah, make an ed educated guess, I guess. So now I will show the results of the second work we did, which was simply trying to identify all the problems and difficulties with estimating the fractal dimension and which estimators are the best, the best, etc., etc. That's this uh, this paper here. So I will only show one thing. Let me just say quickly, the alternative estimate, uh, method to estimate the fractal dimension is to compute the, if the scaling of the information necessary to identify a point in the data with precision epsilon. I won't tell you right now how to compute this. It, it is one thing you can compute, actually it is really easy. And here are some results from this paper. Uh, this plot has a lot of information. Don't worry, we don't have to go through all this information. What it shows is something uh, easy to understand. It shows first uh, an, uh, some chaotic uh, data set and then adding different levels and types of noise to this data set. And then it does the computation I just mentioned. It computes the correlation sum versus uh, uh, the size of this, of this ball. And the different plots or the different colors are the different kinds of noise. And we don't have to go through everything. I just give you the, the, the summary or the results. What happens in the case of the correlation sum is that you have a change of slope at the noise radius. So if you think about it, if you have a chaotic attractor and you just add additive noise to it, then in truth, you have merged two objects with two different fractal dimensions because the chaotic attractor and the noise have different fractal dimensions and you just put them together. But of course, the point is the correlation sum just cares about what happens at a specific uh, length scale. And if the specific length scale suddenly becomes the length scale of the noise, then the noise has much more to say about the fractality of the set than the other deterministic structures that might have larger uh, length scales. And therefore, in these nice curves where you want to estimate the slope, well, in fact, the slope that you get is the slope of the noise. 
On the other hand, the alternative method I presented, where you have the, the information necessary to identify a point, well, it does instead, when it gives you the, the fractal dimension, it gives you something like a weighted sum of the fractal dimensions of the two objects. So if you have like 10% noise, you get something like a weighted sum of the 10% of the fractal dimension of the noise and the remaining of the set. So at some points, it might be advantageous to have the correlation sum method because it might give you the noise level. Unfortunately, um, when you use exactly the same process in real data sets, you have problems because in the correlation sum method, you can never identify a, sc a linear scaling region because noise in the real world is actually multi-scale. It's not, you just don't add white noise to processes. That's not, that's not how the real world works. On the other hand, you can still have a valid estimate using the entropy method. So that's kind of a brief, quick conclusion. So second to last slide. Uh, okay, what happens if we actually try to do this to in, in, paleo, in actual paleoclimate data <laughs> to try and find climate attractors? So, uh, okay, this is a really funny story. So what I have on the screen is first getting a time series from the Vostok ice core data. And what you can do then with this time series is reconstruct a, st a state space set from this time series using a technique called delay coordinates embedding. I will not explain this technique. You can trust me that it works. Uh, but this technique has a parameter called the embedding dimension. Think of it as just a parameter in some numerical technique. Now, why you care about this? Because if what you have reconstructed has indeed some kind of low dimensional chaotic structure, then it must be that the fractal dimension you calculate has to saturate versus this parameter I just mentioned, this embedding dimension. That's what the theory says. So what I saw over here are various estimates of this uh, correlation sum versus size curve. So lighter color to darker color is as I increase the embedding dimension. And unfortunately, the fractal uh, dimension, which is the slope of these lines, remember, the slope of these lines is the fractal dimension. It does not converge with embedding dimension. That's the first problem. The second problem is that they, they, these curves don't even have a constant slope, which makes the entire estimation valid. So I say this is a fun story because what I just did in front of you was done in two nature papers, not just one, who, who, who claimed that climate is three-dimensional. And this, of course, raised uh, some eyebrows. So that's why I think it's a funny story. <laughs> All right, if you thought these things are cool and you would like to learn more, where mostly or almost everything I said comes from this book that we just published. It's called Nonlinear Dynamics with Ulrich Parlitz, published by Springer. It has a nice fresh approach to teaching nonlinear dynamics that is really fully practical and hands-on. And it is very much concise because I know you're all very busy. <laughs> so you want something that you could read possibly fast. And it also shows you how to use actual code. So there's actual code in the actual book pages <coughs> that tells you how to compute exactly the things I just presented. Here, this code tells you how to compute the, the, cor the correlation sum versus epsilon, for example, and find the fractal dimension. So that's it. That's the end of the talk. Thanks. Thanks for your attention.